It is dark outside. To protect myself against the creatures of the night, I have this flashlight. But suddenly, it stops working. They've only waited for such a moment, and they will not miss this opportunity. Life is short. Welcome to Kuvulu, the sorcery of copper. In this episode I'll talk about this flashlight. I've modified it so I could remotely turn it off. This was one of the props we used during the Halloween party, which I've mentioned in the previous episode. There we had a game where we put participants in a labyrinth of really dark corridors, black corridors, and they only had this flashlight to navigate through them. And at a specific point in the progress, we switched off the light so we could light up masks of clown. We were on each side of the corridor trying to corner them. And the only way they had to escape them was to pass by one of us. In the previous episode I did something very similar where I had to control a light, this floodlight. And to switch it on and off I used a solid state relay and to control the solid state relay I used my go-to default development board which is the blue pill based on an ARM Cortex microcontroller. But for this project I want to control the lights which are inside this flashlight. And as you can see it is a lot smaller and these components will not fit inside here. So we have to find something else. To find a microcontroller which fits our needs, we will use something called the power metric search. And for that, we go to the website of our electronic pass distributor. And in this case, as example, I used Mouser Electronics. And the part we want to look for is a microcontroller. So we first go into category microcontroller. And we can see that they have a choice of 45,000, over 45,000 microcontrollers. But after that, you can apply filters. And this way we can restrict the choice of microcontrollers and we can actually put in the requirements or the constraints we, we have. First, the requirements. We can start with the number of input outputs. So we need one input, which is the command which will be received by an infrared demodulator. And this will tell the microcontroller, please switch on or off the light once the command is decoded. So it's one input. And we need one output to actually switch on and off the light. So we need two input outputs. We can see that this is the minimum. All microcontrollers have at least two input outputs. But we want a small one. We don't want more pins. So I will go up to eight pins because if we go more than eight pins, the package would be larger, the microcontroller would be larger, and this is not what we require. We want a small one so it fits in the case of the flashlight. So we apply the filter. This will remove everything which is grayed out, and we can see that we are already down to 750 microcontrollers which fits our needs. Now, let's continue talking about the case, the package. I will not produce a board for it. I will directly solder the wire on the pins of the microcontroller. So I want pins which are large, easy to solder on. So no QFN, no TQFP or no QFP, no um, DQFN again here, this is DFN. We want either a dip, dip eight pin, there is nothing more than a pin, or we can use a so so eight, soic eight. So already the pitch between the pins is uh, smaller than soic, and it's already too small. So we have these three choices in case, and these are easy to solder. Apply filter. We are at two hundred seventy one. Another thing which we can look for is the program memory. So. I will only decode an infrared command and switch off uh, on and off a light. I don't need a lot of flash size or program memory size, but I'm developing the, the device first. So I will use some debugging strings just to help development and figure out if something wrong, what happens. So strings, text, printing out, some things need a bit of space. I will not start with 1K, although at the end, I'm sure the program will not be bigger, larger than 1K. I will start with 2K and we're going to go up to 16K. So we have even less, 176 microcontrollers. And the last requirement, which is really important for me, is the operating supply voltage. In a previous project, I used an STM32F103 
I didn't care about the supply voltage because I had 5 volt going in and I control the 5 volts. Now here we have a gadget, the flashlight, which has its own operating voltage and I cannot change it. I cannot use any power. In flashlights, you have several models with different kind of battery. Either you have two times AA battery or two times AAA battery. It means that it's three volts and it goes down to two volts. The cutoff voltage of this AA or AAA battery is around one volt. So it needs to be able to at least operate at two volts. Then we have also flashlight which could use a LiPo battery. So their operating voltage is between 3.6 and 4.2 volts. Then we could also have a flashlight, which is actually the case here, which uses three AAA battery, meaning 4.5 volts. To be able to use any flashlight with all this configuration of batteries, which is pretty much all of them, we will use a microcontroller, which operates between 2 volts and 4.5 volts, or in this case, 5.5 volts. So we apply this filter, and as we can see, we are already down to 41 microcontroller. Now, what I also like to filter is use parts which are in stock and which are active. This means that they are easy to acquire. They are still widespread. It's not something which is very exclusive, very rare. It's common to find, they're well supported and so on. So it's kind of a good indication. And we can see we are already down to 38 different microcontrollers. And here's the list of them. Now we could sort them by price depending on the quantity we want. And we can see the cheapest one, which fits perfectly on need. Space enough, Stoic 8 package, which is good enough to solder wires on it, only cost 40 cents. And here we can have a look at the series and we can see that there are not a lot of series. Either we have the Atitiny, which uses an AVR core, previously Atmel, now microchip, and then the PIC12. I'm familiar with both microcontrollers because I use them in previous projects, but I did a bit more on the Atitiny, so I will probably use one of these Atitiny and not one of these PIC devices. In this example, I used the parametric search from the distributor Mouse Electronics, but you could use any other distributor, being it Nuya, Digiki, Farnell, they are pretty much similar. But you can also go to someone like LCSC. So this has microcontrollers from the Chinese market, which are a bit exotic, but if you go in high quantity, you will get very, very cheap prices. But as you can see, this parametric search doesn't offer a lot of options, so it's just luck if you find something which is interesting, but at least it's cheap. And if you don't want to go to choose between one distributor, you could use a search engine like Octopart, for example. This also offers a lot of options in the parametric search, but it uses parts from a lot of the distributor. These are all distributor which are referenced. The problem is that the quality of the information is not very good from all distributors. So what you find here is sometimes random and the quality is not that good. But at least it gives more options and it doesn't restrict you from one distributor. If you want to compare the prices and the, um, and the options between distributor, why not use Octopart? But you could also go the other way around. Here we looked that we want to choose an Atitiny. Then if we go to Microchip, which produces the Atitiny and select the 8-bit AVR core, we can see that it also offers a parametric search for all in microcontroller. But uh, this is a lot more detailed because this is the manufacturer of the chip. It has more information and a more powerful search engine. So if you want to search, for example, if it has a UART or SPI or the number of UART or SPI peripherals, this might be the way to go. So as you can see, there is no one solution for, for parametric search. And pr sometimes you just have to combine multiple of them. Or the other way to do it. Just look at your part pins. And if you're lucky enough, one will fit. To remotely operate the flashlight, I found this remote. This is not by Nikon, this is for Nikon. So this is 
obviously a clone to trigger cameras and it is very easy to operate because you just need to press on the button and then it triggers the shutter but we will repurpose it because it fits really our need it is small so it is easy to hide from the participants by the operator and it is easy to operate because you just have it in the hand and you have one large button to switch on or off the flashlight so it fits on it but we need to decode the signal here and you have to look at the previous episode to have the details how to decode infrared signal here we'll just apply the method so first we need to figure out the frequency and as we can see here the frequency is 37 kilohertz so around 38 kilohertz the by far most common frequency used for infrared modulation and now if we look at the blue line which is the signal we have to go back to decrease the time base then I will move the trigger point so we can have everything at one screen and let's have a look yeah this is a, the this is the waveform and it is very simple and it is always the same first you have a large burst which allows the infrared demodulator to tune itself and then you have three small bursts which are around 20 to yeah, 20 to 30 milliseconds afterwards and these small birds will indicate the will indicate the signal and this is very easy so we will just have now to program this uh, commode for the Nikon camera into the microcontroller and then we are able to use this remote for a flashlight now it's time to build a real first prototype and I had some torches lying around which was perfect so for our need and I had two of these so this is very simple here we have two batteries and on the front we actually have a reflector and some incandescent light bulb no new super LED very old style and how it works is just, just you have a switch and you can switch on and off the flashlight and it gives this old style yellowish light which is known from these incandescent bulbs now what I did is used it and modified it. So now you, the user, which will be the player of the game, cannot switch off and on the light, like on this one. What happens is that the operator of the game can do it using this Nikon remote. So just one button, which is simple to use. With one button you switch on, and if you press again, you switch off. And this is independent of this switch. And as you can see, the off signal makes actually the light flicker, which is pretty useful. And thanks to the microcontroller, we can actually program any pattern we want. But this small blinking pattern might give the player the impression that there is a malfunction or there is some problem with the batteries, they're going low or so on. So it just adds a scary effect. Now, it works fine with the remote remotely, but this is a very light remote with a small LED. So it might work around five meters, but not too much further away. Plus, the, uh, the player might be wandering around or might be facing away or the torch might be in some corner. So the operator might not be able to remotely operate the flashlight. So instead of this, I also provide this remote control. Now, this device is a TVB Gone kit. TVB Gone is kind of a toy, or it's a small device, and as the name says, it is meant to switch off all TVs. So this small microcontroller here has a lot of code stored inside, infrared codes, which it will blink using these infrared LEDs and try to switch off all LEDs. So here we have narrow beams LEDs, here we have wide beams LEDs, here we can see transistors, and here we have two large batteries. And with that, we have very powerful LEDs, around, I think, maybe around 100 milliamps, I don't know exactly, but very powerful. And you can easily switch uh, TVs off out of 20 meters, and it's perfect for what we need. We can see here also that there is a programming header. So what I did is not use all the remote codes, but I've programmed the Nikon code, which recorded. And with that, instead of switching off and all TVs, if I press on the button, I switch on and off the remote, the remotely switch off, on and off the flashlight. And because of the high power LEDs, the operator will have no issues anymore or no issues at all operating this flashlight. So that's perfect for what we need. 
between these two remotes, you won't see a lot of difference and the player won't notice any difference. But we've added some circuit to control the light. Where I've added it is in the head itself. So I need to add it in the head because this is where the plus and the minus come. And here you see the small modification. So let's remove the light bulb. And I was able to cramp everything in here. So this was one of the requirements, having everything small so we can fit it in the flashlight. And so here we have the small microcontroller, which has the ear modulation decoding and LED pattern. Here we have the transistor because we need to switch a lot of current going through the bulb. So it should be able to switch at least 0 0.5 amps or 1 amp. These incandescent lights use a lot of power. And on the other side, we have the infrared demodulator. So the microcontroller will really receive the signal from the infrared demodulator and then control the light through this transistor. And it is very neatly hidden or at least mounted on the head. So you can put it back in. And because the shell is transparent, the infrared demodulator can actually receive the infrared signal. And then we can put it back in the lamp and we can switch remotely the, the light and the user will hardly notice the difference. So that's really perfect. Now we have an issue with this prototype is that this will be handled by the player himself and we want to scare the shit out of him and he will be in the dark so at some point there will be uh, loud noises and he might be very afraid so what he will try to do is switch on and off or just very hardly tap with the torchlight on, on the wall or anything like that or just drop it because he's scared anything could happen and this is just plastic so it is not very robust and I think that after a couple of usage it might break which is not the ideal solution. So to balance that, I had to build another prototype. And I was again looking around in the flat and I found this flashlight. So this is a cheap LED flashlight. So here we can see we have an LED ring instead of this incandescent bulb, but they are very cheap, very popular. And what's most important, they are made of aluminum. They are practically unbreakable. So there's just a very large, very clunky switch on the back, but except that they're very, very robust. So it's ideal for what we want. This one has not been modified, but this one has. So it's almost the same thing and you will find a lot of differences, uh, uh, a lot of different vendors for these flashlights. And here we can see this is the end result. And as you can see here, without pressing on the button on the back, I was able to switch on and off. Now, one advantage of this one was that this was a clear case. So the, sig the infrared signal could go through it and activate and remotely control the flashlight. On this one, this is metal, this is aluminum. So the light will not penetrate in here. And I could drill a hole in there, but then it will be noticeable by the user. What I did instead is I put it on the only way it could be reachable. Here on the front, you see. On the normal flashlight, you have an LED in the middle. On this one, you have the infrared demodulator. And this way, it can be reached by the remote to switch on and off. And by the user himself, he won't notice it. Really, particularly if it's on, it's just too bright and you will, you will notice, it, notice it. So this is the final prototype and we will see how the user handles it. But because it is aluminum, it probably unbreakable and even if it drops, even if he smashes it, it's, it's really the perfect fit. This flashlight is even smaller than this one and I was still able to put the circuit inside. So let's have a look at it. Here on the back we have the huge clunky switch and normally this is just to have access to the batteries. Here we can see we have three AAA batteries, so it's not AA but AAA, and this gives enough power. And we can also actually remove the head. So this is just a tube, there's nothing. And if we look here, this is what was inside. So let me remove this ring, which is there for the ground contact. Up. 
not easy to remove, which is actually a good thing because we want it to be robust. Oh, voila. Now I removed it. And here we have the complete assembly. So this was worth what was there in the, uh, what was there. This, uh, all the LEDs were soldered on this microcontroller, on this uh, PCB. Uh, here we can see even the LEDs. What I did is just add the modification. So we can see the transistor, which is right here, to switch on and off all LEDs. This is the center pin plus, and then this will be the negative from coming from the case. Here we have the microcontroller. So instead of having the large PDIP um, form factor for the ATI Tiny, I used the TSOP8, which is even smaller and fits really well in there. And the rest is here. Well, the rest, the only remaining part which was missing is the infrared receiver, and it fits pretty nicely in here. So it's very compact, and because the circuit is rather simple, you can fit it in small devices and almost all uh, flashlight like this one. So let's put everything back together. This is very robust. Switch on everything. This is plus. Put it back there. Yep. And still see if it works. Yeah, I can still operate it. And with that, the second prototype is finished. And it is very robust, so I think it will survive the game, but we will see. The flashlight worked really quite well, so this was a success. But if I would have to do the project again, I would do something differently. First off, I wouldn't use this one anymore. I would use something like this. But while I was building the prototype, I didn't have this one. I only have this one lying around, so that was okay. So the difference between this one and this one is first the switch. Here we have the clunky switch in the back and I had to override this so I was I would still be able to control the circuit with the remote control and not have the user remove the battery power. Here we have a switch which is right here and it is in the front. The second difference is that this one uses these batteries, three times triple A batteries. It's fine and it works okay, but this is a bit more modern. And inside there is a lithium ion battery. It is well, a very common cell. It is here, an 186500 cell. So it's a bit more modern. And the advantage of this is this is rechargeable and the flashlight comes actually with a charger built in right here. You just have to plug micro USB and you can recharge the battery. So it's a bit more convenient than this one where either you had to change the batteries with different non-rechargeable ones or you need an external charger for that. But the most important point why I use these lamps is inside here and I'll have to take it apart to show you. If we take a closer look at the head of the flashlight, we see here first instead of having plenty of small LEDs, we have one big LED on an aluminium substrate just to use as heatsink. But what's more important is what's on the other side. So let me take this and here we can clearly see a PCB, a circuit. And first, this here is a small button to switch in on and off. Uh, it is not the clunky switch we had on the other light, which was somewhere in the back. Then we have LEDs to indicate if it is charging, if it is charged or if it is on or which mode it is. So you could indicate whatever it is. But what's most important is what it's what on this side, here. This is the USB port for charging. On the back here, we see a battery management chip, which is taking care of charging the battery, actually, the lithium ion battery and protecting it somehow. Then here, we have a transistor, which takes care of powering the LED, which is right here. So here are the resistor to set the current going through the LEDs, and this is to switch it on and off. So we already have a circuit which has the battery management and the power LED. But what's most important is this part here. This is the microcontroller taking care of switching on and off the power to the LED. And so this is perfect for our use. We already have a PCB with all the uh, transistor with all the circuits. So what we would need to do is just 
remove this microcontroller, use a pin compatible microcontroller in place. So this is in SOIC ED package, but anything which would be pin compatible is fine enough. Reprogram it as we need, and we already have everything inside here we want. We just maybe need to add the uh, receiver which we could add in the front or right behind this soft button, and then it would be finished. So how do you recognize a lamp which has already a microcontroller inside or not? Very often, if they have a charging circuit, they also have a microcontroller. But what is a clear indication is when they have three modes. If you press on the button here, the first mode is full brightness, the second mode is half brightness, and the third mode is blinking or flashing. And this is very, very often done by a microcontroller. So if you see a flashlight with three modes, there is a microcontroller. So you have everything you need here. Just remove the microcontroller, put your own one in, and the work is already done for you. And with that, enjoy!